So we've now looked at our three non-consequentialist theories. As I mentioned earlier, however, there are theories that deal with the consequentialist, moral theories, ethical theories that deal with consequences. The reason that we have theories that look at consequences is that we're making a realistic concession to a human weakness. We're asking ourselves, is it morally required that we're always charitable to others? Is it morally required that we're always put others' welfare in front of us? Because the risk of doing that means that we become enslaved to others with no benefit to ourselves. And that may mean that the things that we're doing, if they're not reciprocated, end up having a negative impact and are therefore not morally correct. Now, morally correct's a loaded term because we're talking about different theories of moral morality and ethics. The first consequentialist theory is egoism. Egoism basically says that if a act is morally right, an act is morally right only if it promotes an agent's long-term interests. So only if it's of benefit to me is that in the long term is that a morally right thing to do an agent can be a single person an agent can be an organization an agent can be a country there are two types of egoism personal egoism and impersonal egoism personal egoism is based on some relationship that occurs between you and another impersonal um, egoism means you're behaving in a particular way um, without a direct connection to the consequences that you may be causing on others. It's an impersonal process. There are some misconceptions about egoism because it sounds very selfish. First misconception is that egoists do what they like. Well, that's not true. Egoists will do something that's unpleasant in the short term if it serves their long-term interest. Unpleasant in the short term, so it advances their long-term interest. The second misconception is that all egoists are hedonists, that they are only seeking excess. They're only looking for what's beneficial to them, what's exciting to them, what's best for them. Without... Um, without having a moral framework underlying it. Well, egoists can hold and do hold a theory about what is good. And that theory about what is good may be something that aligns with what society thinks is good. It may be often consistent. It may, that may be that their interest is in line with society's interest. Their long-term interest is aligned with society's interest. Thirdly, egoists... The third misconception is that egoists cannot promote other people's interests. Well, that's not true, because if they promote other people's interest, they'll do so if it's in their long-term benefit. What are the problems with this as a theory? Well, the first problem is, from a psychological perspective, egoism is not a really sound theory. The second problem is that many people think that ethical egoism is not a true moral theory. It's just a theory of self-interest. The third concern is that egoism just misunderstands the nature and point of being moral, of morality itself. And the final, and I think this is the, the strongest criticism, is that ethical egoism ignores blatant wrongs. You can do something that's very bad to somebody if it's in your own long-term interest. Which is why people perceive that it's not really a theory of ethics, but a theories of morality, theories of, of uh, a moral framework, a moral theory. However, it is within our framework that we're discussing this semester. 
The final theory we're going to talk about is the other consequentialist theory. It's the utilitarianism theory. We should always act to produce the greatest possible balance of good over bad for everybody affected by our actions. The greatest good for the greatest number of people constitutes what's right and what is wrong. Sacrifice for others. There are different types of utilitarianism. Act, which is what you do, utilitarianism, is the maximization of happiness for everyone as your only moral obligation. Rule utilitarianism is that you should have a standard that should be applied to moral codes as a whole, and we should apply this utilitarian standard only to the assessment of alternate moral codes, alternate choices. These are rules of life, the rules we live by. The six things we need to know about utilitarianism. When measuring happiness, because the ultimate goal of utilitarianism is happiness, we must consider the amount of pain that an action may be may produce. You, be, you may be happy, it may produce pain for others. The majority may be happy, but it may produce pain for others. Actions affect people to different degrees. Almost anything may be right in a particular circumstance. All indirect ramifications must be taken into account. We cannot predict with any level of certainty what the future consequences of an action can be. And our own pleasure should have no more or no less consideration than the pleasure of others affected. Using the word pleasure, using the word happiness in our discussion of utilitarianism, moves it away from being just a rational consideration into a um, uh, effective, um, A-F-F-E-C-T-I-V-E, about how we are affected in making these decisions and how others are affected. What are the criticisms of utilitarianism? Well, the first one is, can utilitarianism really be workable? Can you always weigh up? what's best for the many? Are some actions wrong even if they produce good? And is it unjust? Are you treating the minority badly so the majority can have the benefits? The advantages of using utilitarianism in an organisational context, so managers using it, organisations using it, companies using it, is it does give you a clear base for formulating and testing policies. Do these policies benefit the most people? Do these policies cause a balance? The, The pain for the minority is that outweighed by the benefits to the majority. It's an objective way of reasoning a conflicts of self-interest and it's flexible and results orientated in the way you make moral decisions. You can also see that from those criteria though that utilitarianism could be used retroactively to justify poor decisions. We needed to pay all the workers less because and not pay them their correct amount because if we didn't pay them the correct amount the organization would collapse and nobody would have a job we're benefiting everybody by paying a few by exploiting a few i'm being careful on these tapes not to mention particular companies for example that are involved in wages theft but we'll talk about those in the tutorial Wages theft is a good example for companies justifying the benefits to many. Self-interest and utility. Self-interest is consistent with utility if you follow a traditional Adam Smith type view of what business is. Now you've dealt with Adam Smith in other topics. You've dealt with this theory of the organization's only interest is to um, 
make profit for its owners. And if the organisation does that, that will overall ultimately benefit society. So Smith is better aligned to an egoistic view of ethics, where pursuit of the greatest economic good for the whole society is produced by individuals seeking to produce uh, to achieve their greatest good. So let's contrast those theories, however, with so those consequentialist theories in um, organisations, and particularly the utilitarian theory, with the non-consequentialist theories, um, um, and how they would fit within organisations. So. The virtue and um, care theory of ethics are the two uh, non-consequentialist theories that are not Kantian, not Kant's theory. Um, Non-Kantian forms, virtue ethics, say moral decision-making involves the weighing of different moral factors and considerations and acknowledges that Organisations have legitimate goals to pursue, but they need to balance those legitimate goals against a moral code. Non-consequentialist theories say that organisations have no overarching obligation to continually seek to enhance general welfare, but do stress moral rights, human rights as crucial factors in moral deliberations. So what are moral rights and human rights in these non-consequentialist, non-Kantian theories? A right is an entitlement to act, to have others act in a certain way. If one has a right, you also have a duty. And now we're beginning to link to Kantian theories as well, because Kantian theories are about duty. Different types of rights are legal rights, moral rights and human rights. Human rights tend to be universal, are not transferable, are unable to be relinquished, and have and there are a series also of natural rights which you're born with by being virtue of being human. They fall into two broad categories negative rights and positive rights. Negative rights about do, are about um, doing things that don't do harm to individuals. I need to, I've just uh, clicked over a slide I didn't mean to. Let me go back to where we were. Negative rights are about not doing harm to individuals. Um, positive rights are about affirming your rights. Negative rights about not doing something. Positive rights about doing something. It's not always clear who has the duty to provide certain rights. See how we're now moving into duty theories, Kantian theories. Interpreting a right as negative or positive is sometimes um, controversial. And once moral rights are asserted, the locus of moral judgment becomes on the, in, on the individual, not on society. Non-consequential theories um, are are well justified, I believe. So I think that these non-consequential theories, I think people do have an underlying set of principles, but different people have different opinions. How well justified are principles and rights? The principles and, uh, um, and the, uh, that, sorry, principles may not always seem to be obvious. So therefore, they might not always be the best way to guide our moral decisions. And can non-consequentialist theories satisfy the way you handle right conflicts when there's a conflict between the rights and conflict between the principles? And do we have a duty to ensure rights and principles? So when we look at how we make moral and ethical decision-making, particularly in organisations, we could argue that moral judgment should be logical based on facts. They should appear to, they should, they should appeal to sound moral principles. They should be defensible in public and we must be willing to universalize 
our moral judgments. So what have we talked about there? We've covered in the whole lecture today and the broken up sections of the lecture. We've covered what is a moral agent. We've talked about um, the two virtue theories, Aristotle's virtue theory and ethic of care. We've talked about the duty-based theories, the deontological theories, Kant's theory of ethics, and, and W.D. Ross's extension, and those three areas, virtue, care, and Kant, are our non-consequentialist theories. Then we've looked at our consequentialist theories, egoism and utilitarianism. And then we've looked at the differences in approaches to ethics. And in the tutorial and in the um, forum, we're going to look at objective eight. As well as these lecturettes, there's videos that explain and provide examples of how each of these theories play out. I'll see you in the Zoom workshop.